Um, so I'm a soil scientist. I'm starting to notice the pattern of the, the talks <laughs> from, uh, from one another uh, to another. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is just to talk about some of the, the kind of concepts that I think are quite exciting and interesting and revolutionary um, in soil science at the moment. Um, I'll, I'll have a slightly easy ride because Kate has already introduced me. <coughs> concepts that I've introduced as well. Um, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of the, the work or the, the data that I've been uh, working on as well and try and keep that to a minimum because I don't think you want to see lots of graphs. Um, um, but then at the end of my talk I'll, um, I'll make an attempt to try and think about um, whether farmers may or may not want to invest in soil uh, and what type of people may or, or may not be persuaded to do so. Um, and I'll highlight that I'm not very qualified to do that, but I think there's people in the room that are, so that's very much a first attempt for me, and an uh, attempt to try and get you to help me um, and stimulate some discussion. Um, so my first slide is taken from a, um, a workshop that we held in uh, Reading about this time last year, um, where we were talking about this concept of, of soil and health. Um, and I think David said yesterday that um, when we're talking about soil quality, which is a very similar concept, that there's a lot that scientists, soil scientists, kind of disagree about. We, we, we're very good at kind of arguing with each other about what's important, but actually the reason why I put this slide up here is because if there is one thing that soil scientists tend to, to broadly agree on, is that we think that organic matter um, is important. So we think that's very underpinning and we think it's an important component uh, of the health or the quality um, of a soil. And so we have all these other ways that you might want to measure or indicate soil health, so things like water retention, pH, the nutrients, some earthworms, microbes, structure. But soil, but organic matter is the one on the far left hand side that almost everybody agrees um, should be in there somewhere and is important. Uh, and so I'd just like to dwell on sort of what is organic matter and, and, and how um, organic matter turns into soil organic matter. Um, and so whether you're farming, farming in an urban garden or whether you're um, farming uh, thousands of hectares of fields, there's um, various ways that you can get organic matter into soil. Um, so you can add manure into that soil, you can add composts um, or other agricultural wastes. Um, you can grow plants with the explicit intention uh, to kill that plant, not harvest anything, and put the entire biomass uh, into the ground. Um, and in fact, the very act of having a plant uh, in the soil, um, it will start pumping carbon out the bottom of its roots uh, into the soil with the intention of, of feeding the biology uh, in the soil. And so soils that have a high concentration of organic matter soil organic matter tend to hold water slightly better. They have a, a better structure, these aggregates that again Kate was uh, talking, about, talking about seem to form. Um, that, some of that organic matter forms part of the microbial biomass, the life that lives in soil, not just microbes, but the entire food web. Um, and then this sort of um, helps us to sort of infiltrate water uh, into the soil and provide these various functions that produce benefits for um, the humans essentially. Um, so soils with higher organic matter tend to um, uh, have higher yields uh, crops, they tend to have um, higher crop quality, so whatever attributes um, that you're looking for in your crop um, can be enhanced by having a soil with a high amount of organic matter. Um, and there's also ancillary benefits as well, so it can help to reduce the erosion of a soil so to prevent less of it ended up in the, uh, uh, the river and uh, uh, impacting upon the water quality and to help more of it stay on the field so that it creates a slightly more um, sustainable system. Um, and so, again, so Kate's kind of slightly scooped this revolution I was going to introduce you to as well. But, um, uh, and you should have... Um, uh, a picture, a figure from a famous paper in Nature uh, in 2011. I've essentially kind of redrawn this and I'll tell the story a little bit how I like to tell it. So, um, a decades ago, when scientists were taking, looking at the organic matter in soil and they were carbon dating that organic matter, they discovered that some of that organic matter in the soil was in fact up to thousands of years old in some cases. Uh, and so, the traditional theory of, of how that soil organic matter became to be thousands of years old was essentially a case of probability. 
so they thought, well, okay, a, a piece of organic matter, whether it's a, 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 a cover crop or a, a piece of straw or a leaf, for example, from the tree, would have been degraded, and, and some of the compounds within that leaf or whatever would be very resistant to degradation, and just by chance, there'll be some of those molecules that would just never get around to being eaten by something and then remain in that soil, and this is the uh, this concept or this idea of humus in the soil. Um, current or emerging thinking is that actually that's not the great case. Uh, and in a very short space of time, all of the organic matter, so for example the crop residues, which is what I uh, tend to focus some of my research on, most of it, in fact almost all of it, gets metabolized relatively quickly by the soil food web. And so you'll have to use your imagination with the soil food web because I'm not very good at drawing soil printers, but so these, these bacterial cells here represent the other um, uh, life that lives in soil and so and so within a year or two the majority um, and again I don't want to put too many numbers on this but I would I would, I would hazard maybe 90% or so of that carbon that was added into the soil becomes carbon dioxide because those organisms are, are respiring and they're using it uh, for energy now a small amount of that um, carbon um, will move into what we might call the microbial nephromas and that's what Kate was saying is dead microbes, not just dead microbes, but dead other soil organisms, so nematodes, um, columbia, mites, um, and earthworms that I'll come on to talk about in a moment. Um, and it can also be the molecules that are, um, that are produced and uh, excreted by these, or secreted by these microbes as well, so they don't have to die to be sending these uh, carbon compounds out into the soil. And then there's these two primary mechanisms by which that soil organic matter is stabilized and prevented from being eaten or metabolized uh, by microorganisms. And one of them is the aggregates, again, that, um, that Kate talked about, the idea that something can be physically protected, so encased um, in this uh, sort of tomb that is the, the aggregate and the, and the carbon is in, in, in the center, and the carbon helps keep the aggregate stable, and the aggregate helps keep the carbon protected from being um, metabolized. But there's also chemical sorption as well, so, so these uh, compounds can stick to the surfaces of the soil. And so certain soils that have a higher surface area, so a higher clay content, so maybe less sand and more clay, they tend to have a greater capability to, to trap and, and keep uh, more carbon. But having said that, these, these aggregates break down and this organic matter um, comes and detaches from the surfaces of the soil and then it goes back into this microbial or the, um, the food web, and then it can be metabolized, turned into carbon dioxide, or it could be secreted once again, so it cycles around. So this, this, these carbon compounds that have been in the soil for perhaps up to thousands of years may have been through this loop several times, and by chance it, that carbon compound never went up into the atmosphere, and it just happened to cycle around in this loop for, uh, for, for many, many times. However, the, the bit that I'm more interested in at the moment, at least for the purposes of this talk, is not so much the, the stable carbon, but actually it's the, it's the biology in the centre, so this is not my artwork, I might just add, but it, it's the stuff that lives in soils and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the organisms that are doing things for us. So when something is respiring and producing carbon dioxide, sometimes they're, they're doing work, and that work um, can be for the benefit of the soil um, and could possibly be for the benefit of humans that are using the soil uh, in order to do something such as growing a, a plant. Uh, and I particularly want to focus on organisms that improve structure. Um, and Kate, quite rightly, I, I don't disagree with anything that Kate said, that microorganisms are very important for improving the soil structure, but actually I'm going to focus on earthworms and, their, and the importance that they play um, in soil structure. Um, so on the left-hand side, it's a, it's a little bit light-coloured, but there's a, a time-lapse photography of some, of some earthworms moving um, up and down their burrows. And the purpose of this slide is really to, uh, to talk about the influence of the earthworms on that structure of the soil. So they're moving through the soil and they're creating these big macro pores, um, and they're also producing casts, so worm poop. Uh, and some of these um, casts can be very stable and hard, and some of them can actually uh, com um, dissipate very quickly as well, depending on the species. Um, and so we, broadly speaking, we have three different ecological groups of earthworms, and I'll just quickly introduce you to them. So, 
So we have these surface-dwelling earthworms, and these uh, mostly move around on the surface of the soil. They don't often burrow into the soil. Uh, and they take this fresh organic matter. So you tend to find them in, say, forests or, or places where we have lots of um, uh, litter left permanently on the surface. Um, and so they break down that litter, um, and they turn it like, into little compost heaps, essentially, on the surface uh, of the soil. And the second type is these uh, vertical burrowing earthworks. They have these permanent vertical burrows, and they come up out of their burrows, usually in the night time, and they drag stuff from the surface, so some of that litter from the surface, and they drag it, drag it down into their burrows, um, where they can ingest it, and they mix it with microorganisms, and they mix it with their own feces, um, and when they try to decompose that organic matter to make it more palatable and easier uh, for them to ingest. Um, and those are, that, that earthworm may keep that burrow for a very long period of time as its home. It will stay there, um, and as long as conditions are good, it will stay there perhaps for the entirety uh, of its life. And the third type of these horizontal burrows, uh, and so these are moving round, I like to think almost like Brownian motion in a, in a random um, direction, uh, ingesting um, organic matter or uh, and distributing it around the profile. And these are the ones that I actually think are um, are very important for the uh, for generating the structure in the soil that is important uh, for plant growth. So the, the vertical burrowing earthworms are very good at producing channels um, whereby they can take flood water or bring water into the soil. But I think these horizontal burrowing earthworms um, that can sort of turn a sort of a clod of soil into this sort of nice crummy texture that we like to look at is particularly important for plant growth. Um, and so, so my scientific hero is, is Charles Darwin, and um, about 150 years ago, Charles Darwin wrote a really important book, I'm sure you've all heard of it, um, it's called On the Formation of Vegetable Mold by the Action of Worms. Um, and at the time, this was a, um, a much uh, more popular book, so it outsold The Origin of Species, which I think he, he also worked on as well. Um, and and at, the end of, um, at the end of this book, um, he says, that long before uh, the plough existed, the land was in fact regularly ploughed and still continues uh, to be thus ploughed by earthworms. So he was drawing this analogy between the earthworm uh, and the plough. And I think that's quite an interesting analogy to dwell on because at the moment, um, you know, 150 years later, a lot of farmers, particularly in the UK, but I think globally as well, are starting to put the plough back in the shed um, and starting to say, okay, over to you, earthworms, uh, perhaps you can now sort out my soil structure and, uh, uh, and do that plow for, uh, for you. And I, I guess if there's, if there's one message for this talk, it's that they're not going to do it for free. You have to feed them. So they need that organic matter. They need that food to go in, into the soil. It's not the case that you can put the plow away, stop burning your pet, <laughs> and then sit back and let the earthworms do the job. They're going to need payment for that. Um, and so what the earthworms are doing is they're generating this structure that, and that, that, that certainly, I believe, enables a, a plant root to move its way through the soil with more ease. Um, and so they're creating these aggregates and they're creating these macro pores. Um, and the analogy that I like to use is perhaps, so um, I came up on the train um, uh, yesterday and it wasn't a particularly busy train and that meant that if I was wanting to go to the toilet in the middle of the carriage and I could move my way through that train with relative ease and if there was somebody standing in the way they have got a place to move into so there's lots of voids in that train but if it was really busy and packed and I'm sure you've all been there in a really packed train kind of trying to get to the other end of the, uh, the carriage and it's a very compact um, environment and even if you wanted to squeeze past there's nowhere to push somebody into no, no space that they could move into. And if you've got a soil like that, it's incredibly difficult um, for, the, for the roots to get through. Um, I'm running out of time, so I might speed up a little bit. Um, this is some of the, the work I've done, particularly looking at the, the, the idea that we need to feed these earthworms in order to, uh, to get them to work for us. So here's an example in the field where we can, we've shown that by increasing the amount of, in this case, compost or farmyard manure, uh, we get a greater population of, of earthworms uh, in the field. And then we've also done some slightly more controlled experiments um, in the lab here where we've drawn a, uh, a nice correlation between um, the amount of energy, regardless of the type of food that we add into a little pot, um, there's a relationship between the energy that we're adding, so the calories that we're adding and feeding that soil and the, uh, and the, the size of the earthworms and the earthworm biomass uh, that's produced. 
And so when I, I was a, a postdoc at Rothamsted Research, I managed a number of large field trials, and this is one of the largest uh, ones of them. We had, um, I think, 220 plots on this trial where we're adding various different forms of organic matter um, into soil with the intention of feeding the biology and trying to see if that improved the structure, which then went on to, um, to improve the yield. Um, and so the way that we did this is we, at the same time as applying organic matter, we were applying different concentration of an important plant nutrient, nitrogen, while ensuring that the plant had all of the available uh, nutrients that it needed. Um, and so as we increase the amount of nitrogen that we apply to the soil, we get a higher crop yield, um, to the point where we, if we keep adding it, we don't really get any additional benefits. Um, and then if we were to apply our amendments as well, we see these curves are shifted up slightly, so we're applying an amendment, and we think that this is due to a physical effect rather than a chemical effect. So it's long been known that if we apply these manures or these uh, organic amendments that they contain fertilizers, the chemicals that the plant needs, but we're taking care of that by doing it on a scale of, um, of fertility, if you like. So this, this addition of the organic matter is providing a benefit above and beyond that which could be explained by the, the chemistry. Um, and this is a good example. This I, I cherry picked this one to show you because on the next slide we did this for several years for several different crops. Um, and the main picture here is the fact that it's incredibly variable. It depends on what year we look at as to whether we get a positive effect, how big that positive effect might be, and which organic amendment um, was uh, more beneficial. So there's there's quite a lot of uncertainty in this data. And so after a, a, a four-year project. Um, overall, we can say on average, these organic matter um, treatments produced a positive effect. Um, but unfortunately, um, overall, we couldn't attribute that effect to an individual organism. We weren't just looking at earthworms, we weren't just, uh, we were looking at uh, microorganisms. Um, and it seems to work, but it doesn't provide this return on investment every, every year. Um, so that, that, that brings me, you'll be pleased to know, to my final slide where I've tried to think about that given that uncertainty, why would a farmer want to invest in soil? So if you were on um, you know, Wall Street or a, a hedge fund or something like that, you probably wouldn't do it because you're not going to get short-term um, return on your investment. And so I've tried to think about the, the farmers or the groups of people that I've um, met over time um, and try to sort of group them um, depending on whether they, uh, I've, I've chosen liberal conservative, that may or may not be a wise choice, uh, but I've also thought about um, their sort of short term and long term view if you like. Um, and there's, so there's a perhaps slightly unfair cartoon on the top left hand side of people that are sort of very um, unwilling to change um, and have a kind of a short term traditionalistic uh, view, um, and so that's often because maybe they don't own the land, so why would they want to make a long-term investment? Um, there's also sort of perhaps larger companies that you might consider making long-term investments, but also trying to uh, ensure that they come across this year. Um, they're one of the larger companies, so the larger uh, organisations. Um, there's a, a lot of larger organisations that are also very enthusiastic as, as well uh, and happy to be very innovative. Finally, there's the really fun guys, the, the all girls, the, the enthusiasts, I think. So these are often the people that don't so much care whether they want to make a profit out of it because they're really fun. So they do daft things like bury their underpants in the ground and see how quickly they degrade um, just so that they can see how healthy their soil are. So, so they're often the most fun to work with and they're not often particularly bothered whether they're going to make a profit out of investing in this sort of thing. It's more about the, uh, the ride and the enjoyment of that. Um, so with that, I think I've probably exceeded my time, and I'd just like to acknowledge that this is obviously a huge collaborative effort um, with a lot of people from Rothamsted and from, uh, from Reading and other
question of sort of all these things start intersecting <laughs> with, you know, as we don't think about the kind of liveliness of pathogens, it's about um, the length of time it takes for carbon to cycle. My work exclusively with upland farmers um, previously did research on carbon, <coughs> carbon sequestration up in landscapes. And I think one of the issues is that what we require, require of those farmers um, in which the soil, sort of store the soil carbon is actually the antithesis of what they see as good productive farming. So we're looking for longer term cycle, we're looking at higher farming to bacterial ratio, which necessarily means sort of less improved grassland and more um, sort of wetting and those kind of things. And I think so I think it's really contextual, but I think it's also about sort of maybe being a bit um, a bit less simplistic with our message as well with this idea of soil liveliness is necessarily the be all and end all, but there is complexity and I think getting those more complex messages across the contingency is probably the challenge we have. Um, because I think like you say if you yeah, oh I've done everything to make my soil more lively, but it hasn't done so, yeah. uh, for me it's just it's be very context specific as well, yeah. depending on what they're um, what they're doing. Um, so there's two things that struck me. I think the first thing I'll say is that I quite often talk about the things that you could do uh, when I talk to farmers uh, to improve earthworm numbers or liveliness, if you like, in the soil. And almost everything that's good for earthworms is also good for slugs. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do that and get slugs and things like that. So, 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 yeah. And the thing is, you've got the health of the earthworm population and kind of, in some way, takes part of the slug population, but it's a chicken and egg thing. Uh, you have to have that productive system in order to, uh, to look after it itself. I think it's sort of expanding the idea of soil health plus because the idea of sort of a healthy soil in the upper three one is carbon rich. But often that means it's wetter, but then it's sort of spreading from the plants like what that's what they're looking. So it's it's sort of maybe taking it bigger than the soil, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quantifying those yeah. uh, just a couple of thoughts, Tom. I really enjoyed what you presented. I, I also started thinking about this question and how important the physical structure is especially for plants, because it's going to be pretty tough, you know, putting your roots through the, through the soil. It's not an easy medium to, to kind of plow through. And so I started on a bit of a thought experiment, um, not regarding worms, but I started to think, what if you take the soil away? And of course we've got hydroponics. And if you look at the data from hydroponics, plants grown in hydroponics tend to grow up to twice as fast as they would in the field. And I thought that was astonishing, and that indicates that you're on the right track, I think. That there should be quite a sizable effect of making it easier for the plants to put their roots through the soil. And earthworm should be a key factor in that. The other point was to do with what you showed right at the beginning from what we did in Reading, that showed the importance of carbon that we kind of agree on. We've been doing a, a network analysis on soil properties, looking at how things are interrelated and what's, what's um, important. And the least important that came out from that in Reddit, <coughs> density, is actually the hub. So when you do the network analysis, bulk density is the hub in that everything is interrelated and connected to bulk density, which again indicates this importance of structure. So intuitively, we all think, carbon, pH, nitrogen, because those are all the things that we're seeking to manage. But that physical side we often leave out, and I think you're right on thinking about, you know, how do we articulate the importance of that physical side and how it's managed. So to address the, the first one first, and so a wheat plant is expected, perhaps in the UK, to, to reach a depth of about a metre uh, between the time when it's, um, it's drilled in maybe October um, until the first sort of frost, which you might expect in like November, December. So that's a, that's a race. Uh, and then if we think about a spring zone crop in the UK, which might be sown in, say, um, March, that's got to do a lot of catching up. There was a little bit from our data that shows that this structural benefit is, is more of a benefit for those spring zone crops that need to really establish roots very quickly. Um, and we also looked at some historic data from the uh, the long-term experiments at Rothamsted as well, which showed that um, um, it really depended on the weather during the spring, actually, as to whether this 
structure, if you like, had, whether organic matter had a benefit effect. And it seemed to be that if you had um, a very dry spring, so hence very hard soil, then you got a much bigger boost from, from ha having organic matter in the soil um, than not. I'm struggling to think right now. So, your second question is about the, um, the bulk density. What I was going to say about that is that, um, in parallel to this, I've also done a, a survey. Uh, of farmers, it's not a particularly well selected survey because it's mostly people that I give talks to or follow me on Twitter and stuff like that. And they also come up with organic matter, and unsurprisingly, earthworms as well, uh, top things, but because I bang on about earthworms. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't want to read too much into that. But they also came with bulk density as one of the lowest um, sort of um, perceived soil health indicators. So that it's quite interesting to say that it is underpinning. I kind of agree, it's a very Easy thing to measure, and it really captures the sort of structure of the soil. Sorry, I hear that. Thank you very much. I have two uh, small questions. We're talking about soil health mostly. Uh, what is soil fertility in all the category soil scientists would care about and try to operationalize in some way? And the second question was about the term necro mass. Yep. Uh, and I suppose it's dead in some way, otherwise you would call it necro. I wonder how dead is it? I mean, what, what does death mean in the case of something that is still in the metabolic cycle? You know, right? That's something I really have a hard time to understand. Thin line between life and death and soil. Then why do you call it necro <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, that's good. Yeah, 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 sounds good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think probably to say, it's whether, I guess, you include the life in soil as part of the soil organic matter. So some people would include the live organisms that live in soil as part of the organic matter, in which case necromass is probably a poor um, way to refer to the soil organic matter. But I, I'd, in this example, I've separated that out. I've said the compounds that are either a product of dead microorganisms or things that have been secreted. So I guess something has been secreted, you could suggest that it's no longer alive. But then, then that kind of leads me to the soil health and soil fertility thing. And these are fairly woolly concepts. As well. So we were talking about soil quality yesterday. Um, so that was popular perhaps 20 years ago. Um, and we're now talking about soil health. And I think that the main distinction between those two is that there's kind of an implicit understanding that um, the soil is alive. And it's the life that seems to be the most important part of that, um, that health or that quality. Um, and fertility is, is probably slightly narrower than health, I would say, and that fertility implies that we're trying to grow something in that soil. And often fertility might imply chemical fertility as well. So, if, um, so, so not necessarily, but I would say that when people talk about fertility, they often mean the, the amount of nutrients. Thank you, John. I'm going to ask you to take the questions to the coffee and tea area. So thank you again.